Good evening. Welcome everyone to our exciting webinar tonight. I'm so proud to be here with three uh, extraordinary th uh, school psychologists. Before we get started, I want to remind you of a few quick things. One, we are going to re be recording this, uh, so you can look for this on our YouTube channel in a few days, if, hopefully by tomorrow. So uh, when you do, uh, it is posted. We'd really appreciate if you would share it with any of your friends or colleagues who are unable to attend tonight. We know everybody's very busy um, uh, in this virtual world that we're in. Uh, the other thing I'd like to tell you is that we will be op offering an opportunity for questions and answers at the end. If you would like put your questions in the question box there, um, if sometimes occasionally people tell me they can't find where to put the questions in, then you can put them in the chat. We're going to be looking at both places to make sure that if you have some questions that we can answer it. I also want to tell you that at the end of the presentation, um, our panelists tonight have agreed to share their email address. So don't panic if you didn't get your question answered or you think there's something that you'd like in more detail. If you have an issue in your county you want some advice on, uh, they have graciously agreed that they would be willing to um, try to answer your questions. Of course, they are, uh, like all of us, working at some of them remote, some of them hybrid, some of them uh, all in the office. So we have crazy schedules. So give them some gracious uh, time to um, respond. So I'm really uh, excited about this presentation. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, with um, our evening. I'd like to take a few minutes to introduce our panelists tonight and to thank them uh, for being here. Sarah Kelly, I'm going to introduce her first. She's a full-time preschool psychologist in Guilford County. Um, she uh, has, hold on one second, my mouse froze there. She has 15 years of experience all of which have included preschool psychological services. She specializes in early childhood, autism, and the implementation of positive behavior supports in preschool classrooms. She served on the North Carolina School Psychology Association um, in many capacities. She's very active in her professional organization. She's currently in the Legislative and Public Policy Committee something that I'm very interested in and hopefully we can talk about a little bit later tonight how we can all really get involved in paying attention to what's going on in the North Carolina General Assembly as it impacts our uh, public schools and the services they can offer. Uh, she has also uh, represented school psychology on the Whole Child North Carolina Committee, the North Carolina Pathways to Grade Level Reading, and the School Mental Health Committee. She uh, lives in Greensboro with her husband and her twin six-year-olds, and she claims that she has three adorable pets. Uh, so we're going to take her word at that. Amy Ivey is also joining us tonight. She uh, also is a school psychologist, and she works in the Wayne County public school system. Uh, she has 14 years of experience, same uh, thing. She has worked almost exclusively in preschool psychological services. She supports students in all levels of abilities and the whole range of, of abilities through a comprehensive model of school psychologists. She does crisis intervention, early intervention, MTSS applications and evaluation. Um, and honestly, when she's was telling me about some of the things that she's involved in in her county. I'm amazed that she can accomplish so much uh, being one person. But additional interest she has is advocating for access to high quality support services for children of all ages and abilities, something that we all share with her. And I'm sure many of you are on this call tonight and joining us because you feel the same way. She has also served in her professional organization with the North Carolina School Psychology Association in several ro roles, and she is a member at large as well as being a member of the Leadership Development Committee. She also serves as a North Carolina delegate to the National Association of School Psychologists and as a regional representative to the Board of Directors. So you can see why I'm saying I don't know how she gets it all done, 
She lives in Stantonsburg with her family, uh, four dogs, and she's not going to confess how many cats she has at this time. <laughs> okay, I have a friend that way. And then uh, our third panelist tonight, which we're very proud to introduce, is Laura Riley, and she is in her 20th year as a school psychologist. Um, although she has worked with all grade levels, preschool through 12th grade, she also specializes full-time in preschool for the last 17 years. She works in Cabarrus County, where she's had extensive experience conducting developmental assessments, providing counseling to young children, consulting with teachers and families, and collaborating with school mental health providers and training school staff in preschool-specific topics that include play-based assessments, social and, and social emotional learning. She's also an approved provider for psychoeducational evaluations of children with traumatic brain injuries. And she has served on the North Carolina DPI School-Based Practice Advisory Council for TBI since its inception in 2015. Likewise, uh, we, you see that we have three very um, experienced school psychologist with us tonight. I thank all of them for being here. I hope that you, everyone will pay close attention and learn a lot and have some questions at the end of our presentation. So Laura, I'm gonna let you start uh, us off by kind of giving us an overview of what we're gonna be doing tonight. Sure, of course. And thanks again so much, just like Yvonne was saying, thank you all so much for attending tonight. Um, we feel like this is really uh, important information to share and we are so glad that you're here. Um, our agenda tonight uh, will start with the value of preschool services and then we'll move into um, talking about various preschool options available in North Carolina for um, parents and uh, for parents who would like to um, enroll their child in a preschool program. We'll talk about we'll give it kind of a general overview of what school psychologists typically do regardless of grade level and then we'll talk specifically about what preschool psychologists do then we'll kind of move into uh, um, uh, an overview of what's happening in three different in our three different districts um, so amy represents wayne county sarah represents guilford county and i represent cabarrus county each of our counties, each of our districts does things a little bit differently, and we'll talk about kind of what the numbers look like. Uh, we will finish up our this part of the webinar by um, mentioning some barriers to the provision of preschool services in North Carolina, and specifically preschool psychological services, and then we'll talk about some action steps. So, Thinking about the value of preschool services. Well, you know, I think that we all know that preschool is a really good idea. And we think about the benefits, when we do think about the benefits of preschool for, for young children, we tend to think kind of in the immediate or the short-term sense. We know that preschool is great for helping children develop friendships. And it's great for helping children learn how to follow a routine and have some kind of structure to their day. And we really like the idea of helping kids get ready for kindergarten. So those are some of the short-term benefits of preschool. But there are some significant long-term benefits as well. There's actually some research to back it up. So one source um, that provides some research on the benefits of preschool, National Education Association, um, has, has indicated that kids who participate in an early childhood program, a preschool program, are less likely to repeat a grade, so statistically less likely to repeat a grade, less likely to be identified as having special needs, so less likely to be identified with an educational disability and require special education services. Kids who participate in preschool are more prepared academically for their later learning, they are more likely to graduate from high school than kids who don't participate in an early childhood education program, and ultimately, they tend to be higher earners, so their salaries tend to be better than um, children who don't have the benefit of, of participating in preschool. So, you know, whether we take the short view or the long view, we can see that preschool really is a good thing for kids. So one of the things that we wanted to kind of share with everybody is, you know, people are not necessarily aware, unless they're in the early childhood field, of kind of 
what does preschool in North Carolina mean? Um, one of the things that, you know, in working with Yvonne and just kind of talking with her is, you know, not realizing that we do not mandate any type of preschool program or placement for all children. We do provide pro um, programs for children who are at risk or in, and for children with disabilities. So, you know, thinking about what is out there when we know that preschool is something that is a benefit for all children, knowing that we have a limited amount of free opportunities for our, for our parents out to provide those preschool services. Um, what we do have that are available to parents that are um, looking at preschool services and children that may be in that risk range, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, um, are our Head Start programs, our NC Pre-K, our North Carolina Pre-K, you'll hear us say NC Pre-K um, quite a bit this evening, as well as we have our um, classrooms that are in our public schools. Um, some are NC Pre-K, some are not. Um, when we talk about our individual counties, there's a big um, discrepancy across the state in how preschool services are funded and how they are um, provided in our public education buildings. Um, and then most, what most people are most familiar with are our parentally chosen or private preschool centers or sites. So those are your daycares, your church programs, your part-time preschool programs where parents elect and choose to pay to send their child to a preschool program. Um, so that's kind of where kids fall when we look at what preschool looks like in North Carolina. Um, to kind of give you a little bit of better understanding of NC Pre-K, I used a Guilford County example just because I really like this kind of hamburger model. Um, just a little snapshot again, this is very different from county to county, but in Guilford County, we have about 2,200 kids who are funded through um, state NC Pre-K funds. That was, the, this data is from last year. Um, things have looked a little different this year, but you know, that's a fairly consistent number or um, estimate. Um, so we're, we fund our children, our 22 children, 100 children through our NC Pre-K funding that we get through the state. But then we also are able to fund some additional students in that number through our federal Title I money that we get from the federal government and our Head Start funding, which also comes from our federal government. Um, so a little breakdown of how that looks in Guilford County is we have nine Head Start centers that have classrooms that serve our children who are three four and five years old that are not yet kindergarten age. We have NC pre-K classrooms in private child care centers. So that is a daycare that has chosen to have a NC pre-K program housed in their, um, in their buildings. Um, and then we also have 50 of our elementary schools in Guilford County schools that house preschool classrooms. And that's about 70 classrooms of about 15 to 18 four-year-olds. Um, NC Pre-K um, specifically is just for our four-year-olds prior to that year prior to going to kindergarten. Um, so it's kind of a smaller number. When we talk about Pre-K as a whole, we're talking about all children turning from three to five or right before they turn kindergarten age. Um, the big difference between all of these programs is just a little bit of our criteria. So for example, in our private child care NC Pre-K classrooms and our Head Start sites, we have some criteria that is around um, being at risk by a set income threshold, a military status or IEP or individualized education program or a special education program child. Child has been identified with having a disability. Um, those are what may make a child eligible for one of those sites. And then our other sites for our Guilford County Elementary Schools are is really solely based on developmental need. And so again, a little bit of different ways that how at risk is identified and how we are making those children um, eligible for services. Keeping in mind that when you look at that number of 2,200 children, we have significantly more pre-K age children in our district than that number allots for. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about what preschool special education services are available. So all North Carolina public schools are responsible for the provision uh, are responsible for child fine. And we'll talk about child fine a little more. Um, it's a federal mandate. So we'll talk about that in a minute a little more. But basically what that means that North Carolina public schools are responsible for the provision of special education services for all students starting at age three years, zero months until age 22. So we're focused more on the younger end tonight, but we do start at age three years, zero months. 
that does include students who are transitioning from what is considered the birth to three-year-old population that had already identified special needs. The public school systems are responsible for those transitions into our services as well, but we really start providing those services at age three when they turn three. These responsibilities include screening for possible disabilities, evaluation if there is deemed necessary an evaluation, disability determination, and then also primary and related service provision. So if the child is deemed to need services in order to um, be successful, then we, the public school system are responsible for providing those services, both primary educational services and things like speech, occupational therapy, physical therapy, auditory supports. It depends greatly from child to child. How these services are provided varies greatly from district to district, and where these services are provided also varies district to district. So there's a lot of discrepancy from county to county as how these screenings, evaluations will happen. Some districts are able to provide these services through their actual school employees, the evaluation, the service provision. Some will have actual classrooms to provide some of these services. Some are contracted with outside agencies. Some have locations for the students to be brought to, to have these services provided. It varies greatly. It depends a great deal on funding and also staffing. If there's, if there's a limited number of staff in the district that can do these jobs, such as school psychology services, and there's not enough school psychologists, then you're not gonna be able to provide school psychologists to do this work and instead may have to contract it out. Um, so it really does vary greatly um, from district to district, and we are always looking to improve those outcomes by having these services provided in a high quality manner. Okay. So we spoke briefly about Child Find a second ago, and what Child Find is is a federal mandate to identify and evaluate potential children with disabilities birth to age 21-22. Um, the school system really picks up up starting at age three, as I said before, and birth to two is really handled by um, the Children's Developmental Service Agency, which is another agency. But child find data from 2018-2019, which has been provided by the NC Early Learning Network, really shows where a lot of this identification or where these referrals are made from. So 34% comes from our infant toddler program. That is what the Children's Developmental Service Agency looks at. They cover that birth to two-year-old level. You also have 8% from your NC pre-K programs, your 27% by parent referral. So as a parent in North Carolina, you can refer your child to the public schools for, for screening and consideration of evaluation. 9% or other um, from any number of different other people. It can be agencies, it can be therapists that of outside that are seeing the child already. It can be out-of-state districts that refer the child. There's a lot of options there. 9% come from physicians. Um, in, our, in my own district, we do see a lot of referrals from the, the, the primary physicians in our district, and we have a fantastic relationship, and so we have a, a direct pipeline for them to be able to refer our preschool students to us as needed. 8% come from Head Start. Um, that's also a great partnership a lot of districts have that allow the service provision in the Head Start classrooms once the students are identified, and about 6% from private child care providers. So again, anyone in the community can make that referral to your preschool East Exceptional Children's Services, a doctor, a therapist, you yourself as a parent can make those referrals. So you're not limited in who can make these referrals for your, for your child, but it just needs to be, if you need that support, it can be referred by any of these groups. Okay. So now we're going to talk about um, what school psychologists look like in general in your in your districts. And again, this varies greatly from district to district. It depends on how many school psychologists we have. I would love to say that we have a sufficient number of school psychologists across the state. Unfortunately, we don't. Um, we are definitely in a shortage. It's a nationwide issue, not just in North Carolina, but of course we're focused on North Carolina and having enough school psychologists for our districts. Um, I know of at least, um, the last time I saw there were 12 districts that did not have a school psychologist in them at all. And that's very disheartening because of all of the things that a school psychologist can do for your students and for your districts. 
School psychologists really do straddle the line between regular education, special education, mental health, and parent support. In special education, we can complete evaluations, consult with individualized education teams, counseling as a related service, parent counseling and training, and functional behavioral analysis. In the MTSS, or multi-tier systems of support, we work with our regular education teachers to help identify students that need support in their regular classrooms. We're uniquely trained to provide interventions, both behavioral and academic, and progress monitoring tools to help identify students that are struggling in your regular education classrooms, both social emotionally and academically, and help assist them in that classroom before they need the support of special education. The MTSS system looks at providing supplemental and intensive interventions for behavior, social, emotional, and academic skills before students ever need to leave that classroom for special education. That system also can identify students who may need those special education services if necessary. We also are mental health and crisis providers. In the event of a crisis in the school, um, which can include teacher death, student death, it can include um, any number of crisis or, crisis or traumatic events that can happen in our students' lives. Your school psychologists, along with social workers and counselors, are your frontline defense and support for your students. We're the ones that come in and help to craft, support your principals and your boards of education in crafting a response. We are uniquely trained through the PREPARE model to help support your students and to help support parents also in how to address these issues with kids. Um, we also look at risk assessments for suicidality and for mental health needs, um, and we provide training for staff. Um, many of us that have the opportunity through a comprehensive model do a lot of parent trainings. We do staff trainings to help them be prepared because, in all honesty, these teachers and other staff at your school have your kids a lot more of the day than you do, so you want to make sure these individuals are well prepared to help support your students, not just academically, but across their mental health and behavioral health needs as well. So all of this is th are things that our school psychologists can do and also coordinate with our community partners through pediatricians, therapists, um, autism supports, behavioral supports, any kind of, of need like that, we can help coordinate with families between families and IEP teams to help those those um, services to move smoothly. So really your school psychologist is, is someone that lives, wears a lot of hats and can do a lot of things um, and we're there to support your students and you um, primarily. So thinking a little bit more specifically, oh, I'm sorry. This was, yeah, okay. <laughs> I, I thought I heard a voice. Thinking more specifically about what um, school psychologists do who specialize in preschool. Well, just Amy put it very eloquently. We really do straddle the line, not only in K-12 and you know for those of us who serve kindergartners through 12th graders, but also for those of us who serve preschoolers. Um, so our, our time is spent doing evaluations, providing consultation, parent training, coaching, implementation of social emotional learning supports and professional development. We'll talk a little bit more specifically about those ideas. So in, it, we know that, well, traditionally the job of a school psychologist has been focused relatively heavily on assessment. And that's still, that continues to be a major part of our job. So. Um, much of our time is devoted to um, evaluating, providing developmental evaluations for children's, children who may have disabilities. But like we were saying, that's not the only thing that we do. And thinking a little bit more specifically about, um, about the, the professional development piece that we can provide and that we often do provide. We uh, train school staff, we provide training to parents, we provide training to those in the community um, who may be involved with, uh, with early childhood programs. And some of the professional development that we offer focuses on topics like social skills, how to build, um, how to build emotional regulation in children, how to help them um, with their sense of emotional literacy, identifying and naming and managing their feelings. Um, helping children learn how to 
solve social problems. Those are the kind of informed friendships. Those are the kinds of social skills that we might help with, that we might uh, provide training on. Um, early academic skills or the, you know, the foundational skills that children need to learn reading and writing and math. We provide professional development, um, focusing on supporting students who have special needs. So uh, how to provide services, how to provide support to children who have individualized education programs through the special education department. And then finally, how to support children who have behavioral challenges, how we can you know, how we can change our own behavior in order to help children who have behavioral challenges. Okay, so now we're going to move over and have an uh, opportunity to look at some of the individual uh, school systems here as represented by our panelists tonight, and we'll start with Cabarrus. All right, so our total kindergarten through 12th grade population um, is 33,000, right around 33,000. And, and remember, like, like we were saying earlier, North Carolina does not have mandatory preschool. And so we really don't have an accurate and clear count of the number of preschoolers in North Carolina. Um, and because they are served so differently and because we don't provide general education to preschoolers in North Carolina um, who aren't in a, you know, an at-risk or known risk category, um, we don't we don't have a good count. So our total population of kindergarten through 12th graders is 33,000. So thinking about the population of kids in in Cabarrus County, our preschool department fields about 700 to 800 referrals per year. Um, and these referrals, like Amy was saying, these referrals come in through various sources. Um, many of them come to us through the early intervention program, serving birth to three-year-olds, birth to third birthday year olds. <laughs> um, we also receive phone calls from doctors and um, daycare providers and many referrals from parents. Um, of those referrals, of those 700 to 800 calls, we filter them out and screen a certain number of them, and we have various methods of screening. And of those children who are screened, and some of them are referred for an evaluation. And of those children who are referred for an evaluation, some of those children, most of them, will end up um, being recommended for eligibility for special education. And that's the final number. In our EC program, we have approximately, in a typical non-COVID year, we have approximately 300 to 350 children in the special education program receiving special ed services. So there are two full-time preschool psychologists in our school system. And, uh, and then we also have, thankfully, <laughs> because we need it, we also have several other uh, school psychologists who provide services to kindergarten through 12th graders, but have also agreed or offered to help us with um, preschool assessments. So we have two full-time, several other part-time psychologists. The roles of uh, my role and the role of my colleague in preschool, um, about 70% of our time is spent in assessment. Um, we spend about 15% of our time approximately uh, helping with consultations with teachers and providing coaching. We spend about 10% of our time in counseling and uh, providing parenting skills training to parents specifically tied to uh, a child's IEP. And then about 5% of our time is spent providing professional development. Okay, so looking at Gilbert County, um, they, we are one of the largest districts across North Carolina. We um, probably the third largest after Charlotte Mecklenburg and then Wake County. So our K-12 population is about is a little over 72,000 students. And again, that doesn't account for our um, preschool age children. Um, so that's a fairly large LEA that we serve. We um, in our EC pre-K department, we serve, we get about 1,200 referrals a year. So a little over a thousand referrals. And as Laura so nicely described, it's kind of a funneling process. So 
we may get 1200 calls and then from that a number of them will go to screening and a number will go to full evaluation um and then from that number are on a normal year and even probably by the end of this year, um, we'll be fairly close to about 750 or a little over number of children, free school students with disabilities. And that's with any disabilities. So that would be our children with speech language only, our developmental delay, autism, traumatic brain injury, other health impaired. Um, again, those are um, kind of the big ones that we see in the preschool world, developmental delay being the biggest one, followed by autism. Um, as of right now, in Guilford County, we have 480 preschool students that have been identified with a disability um, and knowing that there are quite a few coming down the pipeline or that are in the evaluation process. To kind of give you a, a snapshot of what, we, what our preschool psycholog psychologists look like, there are four of us who are full-time preschool, which means we only complete preschool evaluations. Um, and then in addition to us that serve preschool, we do all community evaluations, which means we are only taking the referrals that are coming from children who are not in one of our Guilford County schools preschool classrooms. So if I am a school psychologist that serves an elementary school in Greensboro or High Point, and I have a preschool classroom in there, then I will be responsible for any referrals that come out of that classroom. Um, that takes up, that's about 60 of our referrals a year. So that does take a, a number of um, children off of our load for completing evaluations. Um, and, you know, right now we, especially given the backlog of evaluations, we are still doing assessments for about 80% of our time. Um, that is still the majority of our job right now. Um, consultation and coaching. We are a um, North Carolina Pyramid model site. Um, Laura, I think Cabarrus is as well. Um, we are. And what that means is that we are implementing just a tiered framework of evidence-based practices to support positive relationships with children. Um, and again, um, some of the areas that Laura talked about that we serve and when we talk about the trainings that we do in helping teachers with social skills, those are the things that we are working explicitly with specific classrooms on to help teachers build those skills. Um, we also help all of our teachers with implementing a second step, which is a social emotional curriculum across our, um, our district to try to get something in all of our pre-K classrooms that are in Guilford County Schools classrooms. I might need to specify that. Um, and then the other piece that we do is training. And right now, most of our trainings are um, focused on in our schools and our um, in our elementary schools as well as I, I do a fair amount of training with our head starts in some of our private centers uh, specifically looking a lot at children with working with children with autism um, or children with maybe behavioral or significant delays um, that's kind of tends to be the biggest ask that we get um, and the area that we tend to try to go out and help and provide some support in um, but you know that right now because of COVID we do spend a lot of our time in assessment um, and just knowing that we're still trying to address a backlog of students and children that have um, been kind of waiting to come in to be screened or to be referred. So last but not least is uh, me in Wayne County. And as you can see from our total student, student enrollment, um, we are smaller, the smallest of these three counties. However, we're still moderately sized for North Carolina, so we sit at about um, a little over 18,000 students. So that really puts us um, actually on the high side of the medium district, um, and especially in the eastern part of the state where Wayne County is located, we're one of the larger districts. Um, as far as our EC preschool referrals, we do have a similar number to Cabarrus County, but that um, due to the fact that our child find, um, I joke and say it's legion, we have set up a lot of really strong partnerships with um, different organizations and agencies. We do re receive um, services, I mean referrals from our infant toddler program, but we also have direct partnerships with our Head Start programs through um, the Wayne Action Group, so we directly receive a funnel of referrals from them. Also from our primary pediatric, pediatric services, which is Goldsboro Pediatrics, they provide direct services, direct referrals to us as well. Um, also, our, in, our preschool teachers, our resource teachers that go out and provide the preschool services in our private daycares um, also look for referrals and work with teachers there to make referrals. So we really do have a strong referral process um, for 
our preschool referrals. These end up titrating down. Right now, um, we have 188 preschool students with disabilities. Probably by the end of the year, we'll be up about another 100 students, we figure. Um, we usually run close to 300 um, total preschool students before they transition to kindergarten. Um, those numbers will go down again. Of course, with COVID this year, we're down a little lower because of the backlog. But um, that's typically how preschool, um, preschool services look in Wayne County. So preschool school psychologists, uh, there's just me, <laughs> and I am unfortunately not even full-time preschool. Um, I don't choose to sleep at night, so I am the lead school psychologist for Wayne County on top of being um, the preschool school psychologist. So my time, unfortunately, is divided, but still I spend um, three days a week in what we consider clinic or in-house appointments. So I do see children three days a week um, and also work with teachers on an as-needed basis. About 85% of my time is in assessments, unfortunately. Um, due to the fact that I'm the only psychologist in our district that is doing preschool assessments. Um, as Sarah had mentioned, um, in our actual elementary schools, the pre NC pre-K classrooms that are housed there are completed by the psychologists that have those schools, but for the most part, they come through me. About 10% consultation and coaching with teachers, and then 5% on trainings um, at different uh, State of the child conferences and things like that. So that's pretty much how we look. North Wayne County also has a um, community developmental school, which is a rare commodity in North Carolina. There's only a few of them left. And so these schools are for our high seed students. And in Wayne County, we have one that goes from preschool all the way up to age 22. So these are your students who need wraparound services that include often peeps physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, and a very structured classroom. So these classrooms are entirely exceptional children. There are no regular education um, students in these classrooms. And so we do have preschool in that school environment. Um, it is, um, we have a couple of classrooms for that. And those students go half a day and receive those EC preschool services half a day. So there's a morning flight and afternoon flight that come five days a week. Uh, well, four now because we're in plan B. But um, we do have that opportunity, and we have an Air Force base in uh, Wayne County. It's uh, Seymour Johnson Air Force Base. And due to um, our community developmental school, um, Seymour Johnson, the placement at that base has become what's called a hardship placement. So if you have a student that has a large number of needs and you are in the Air Force, then you can request to be stationed at Seymour Johnson so that your, your child can attend that community developmental school or be considered for services there because our services are provided on site instead of having to take your child six hours away to a hospital for therapy once a week or something like that. So uh, we do have a, a probably a little bit higher number of disabilities due to the Air Force base because that is a hardship placement. But um, I think it gives us a lot of diversity and a lot of really interesting cases. So we're always glad to have that. Okay. So we've really talked about what school psychologists can do, what preschool um, services look like, and what opportunities they are. But we also need to address kind of the elephant in the room, which is the statewide barriers and big issues. And there are some barriers and big issues that need to be addressed. And part of addressing this is to ask for your help. As, um, as taxpayers and parents in this, and other community providers in this state, you have a voice that joined with ours can make a lot of difference. So here are the big areas, barriers and issues that we um, are running into on a regular basis. Course number one is funding to support programming and staffing. Since uh, preschool is not mandated for all students, it's always a funding issue. It's always finding funding. It's always asking for funding. It's always asking for funding for staffing. We need more teachers. We need more school psychologists. We have a huge need for school psychologists in the state and what we can do, especially for preschool services. We need funding to support classroom creation. It takes money, unfortunately, to be able to create classrooms and to provide the materials and the setup for these, these kids. So we need that funding support. This support is not just at the state level. A lot of our funding comes at the local level. So going to your county commissioners or your um, whatever they're called in your district and talking to them or your um, city officials and saying we need to put more funding towards school is a great way to increase preschool classrooms and preschool services. Preschool EC services are mandated by the federal government, but preschool in general is not. So we need every funding source we can find to have those sites increased. 
also thinking about out of the box ideas for preschool opportunities. And I can give you an example of one um, in our district for several years, um, we had what was called Wee Wings. And what they did is they took two school buses and they completely gutted them and they converted them into mobile preschool classrooms. And so what they did is they drove those school buses to different locations and they would have a group of 10 or 12 students to come onto the bus for two and a half hours of preschool twice a week and that was their preschool services. Is it everything the parents probably wanted? No, but it does provide two and a half hours twice a week for those students to get some instruction, to get some free play time in centers. There was everything set up just like a normal classroom inside those buses. The teachers were trained to be bus drivers along with teaching. And so it was a fantastic program. We had it set up in church parking lots, at libraries and different communities. And the, kid, the parents would bring their kids there and it helped also our families that had limited transportation because they didn't have to go all the way to a city to carry their child to a preschool program. And it cost nothing. It was funded entirely by local funds. And it was entirely a local funding idea. It was a phenomenal program. We have since moved that program to a location, to a school site, because basically the buses broke down. <laughs> they kept being broken down and they kept needing to be fixed. And so it, becomes, it became pricey after a while. So they moved them to a stationary location um, and those classes are still going on. But ideas like that are things you can do to think outside the box to bring in opportunities for our preschool children. There's also an equity across the state um, in school psychology services and preschool services versus con contract services. In your districts where you have a lot of services contracted, these individuals come in on a very limited basis. They're paid by the evaluation a lot of times or by the service provision, and they don't provide those supports to teachers and to students that a fully invested staff member in your school system is going to be able to provide. Not that we are not appreciative for every single contract we can we can have because it does support our students. But were you going to say something, Yvonne? Can't hear you. <laughs> we can't hear you. You're muted. Amy, it's okay. Your your audio went off for just a minute, but it's back now, so you're good to go. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it's, it's okay. Anyway, so there is an equity in services, and again, that comes down to funding, local and state funding, and ensuring that you're getting um, your biggest bang for your buck there. We also need uh, have the issue of addressing the backlog of evaluations due to limited funding and personnel shortages, but also with COVID. Um, you know, we are very much behind due to COVID and trying to make up and catch up services, so that's always a concern. Creation of opportunities for social and emotional learning through better staffing and funding, and also pipeline shortages for recruitment and retention. Your, your school psychologists specifically are we're having a hard time keeping them because North Carolina does not pay the most, which is not the only reason we go into school psychology, but it's also because we're, we're so understaffed that a lot of people are burning out. It, we're doing a lot of work because all of us, I think, got into this field for caring for kids, not for the money. And so we want to do what's best. And so we're carrying homework and we're doing work on weekends and we're doing everything we can. And eventually it can cause a lot of strain. And so we do struggle to keep psychologists in the district and it's hard to do that. So looking at opportunities to fund internships, looking at opportunities to fund um, bonuses, to fund other op things like that and to increase pay is always a benefit. Um, you want to keep quality staff, then you have to make sure that we're paying them well to maintain them. A lot of times we see people come down because we have openings for um, their internship or for a couple of years to be trained and then they go back to where they pay more in California or in New York or New Jersey because they can move up there and make 70 or 80 grand starting salary. So while I, I don't think I'll see 70 or 80 grand as a starting salary in my lifetime, I would love to see a little pay increase. <laughs> But now I'm going to hand it off to talk about some action steps to help with this. So, Amy, you did a great job of actually kind of kind of weaving these into, as we talked about, some of our big issues. Um, you know, things that every person is, you know, able to do are at our state level, just, you know, being in communication with our state legislators. Um, and I'm not sure exactly who all is on the call, but there might be hopefully a few of you on here um, and some of our state board of education members. 
one of the things you know we really want to do is not just you know we talk about the needs for funding and we need the needs for um, support and personnel and everything else, but it's also just to have a good understanding of what it is that's out there. Um, you know, how are we supporting all children? Um, you know, I this is an area that I'm the most passionate about in preschool because we know it's our biggest return on investment. You know, Laura spoke earlier about how much our um you know early preschool experiences lead to better outcomes and at the end of the day less cost per student but we just want to make outcomes great for all our children but we you know not just making sure that there's clear understanding of what is available out there in terms of services for children especially our children who are at risk or there may be concerns for developmental needs um helping to just communicate that so having those conversations with legislators having conversations with board of education members at our local area is just being involved in your local school board so you know what's going on. Um, you know, I think this year everybody's been even more involved in their local school boards uh, more than ever because of our everybody having very strong opinions about kind of the state of our world right now. Um, but also making sure that we're continuing to be involved as the world kind of turns back to a more, hopefully a more normal um, rotation here as we're kind of moving along. But you know, we're really coming out of one of the biggest you know, traumas that a lot of our children have actually faced in many years. And so there really is that need for that mental health and that support um, in addition to the, you know, working on the gaps that we've lost in some of our education. So being, able, being involved there, um, again, continuing to communicate with your local community leaders um, and even your, um, you know, your community organizations and your um, other people who have involvement in the community um, I know lots of people are involved in outside agencies that, you know, we all want to work together for what's best for children. You know, at the end of the day, that's what we're all here for is to support all of our children. Um, and then just some other things that we, you know, talked about with general action. You know, when we are talking and communicating with um, those that are in decision-making positions, you know, making sure we're kind of sharing what our experiences are. You know, we, you know, in working through this with this team, you know, we've all have had years of different experiences we've had from a professional side of things, but also our personal side of things of, you know, what we've dealt with as our own, with our own family members or family, friends and things like that. Um, you know, what is, how has, you know, things impacted your life as it relates to education in general, and especially for preschool. And, you know, those of you who've had interactions with school psychologists that have been, um, that you've had good experiences with, and hopefully that's been your case and your story, um, you know, share those stories. Those are important. Those are, there's value there. Um, some other places just for more information, you can always follow the North Carolina School Psychology Association through social media, as well as Public Schools First North NC, um, which is what probably got you here today, um, you know, is that social media is such a strong place to get information. Um, and these are two reputable sources that are always trying to share good data-driven information as it relates to students and for public edu education specifically. Um, and then another great preschool resource for those who may not be aware is the North Carolina Early Learn Learning Network um, is part of um, kind of the overseeing body for preschool services in North Carolina. They are the leader in our implementing our um, pyramid model that I mentioned earlier, which is our tiered framework for supporting all students up through our most vulnerable students, as well as our children with special education in the preschool world. Um, so again, that is another resource that provides a wealth of information for, um, for parents and for providers out there as well. Well, I wanna thank everyone for giving us such a really great overview um, of what exactly is going on in preschool services um, and, and just what a school psychologist does. This is the third webinar we've done uh, looking at the need for school psychologists. And this webinar in particular came about because as we were doing the first two webinars, we thought we were always talking about K through 12. We were so surprised to find out all the things that were going on in our public school system and the requirements by law for services to be provided to our preschool population. So I am still in awe and uh, so impressed with the, the work that all of you are doing and the challenges you're facing. Um, so we wanna, uh, now I wanna turn just for a second to make sure that um, we allow other folks to, to join in and have some questions. Um, and if you have a question, now's the time to kind of put it in the question box there. 
um, or in, I'm, I'm checking both places to make sure there's no one there. But one of the um, things that someone um, is, um, let's see what the person right here says, hold on. Um, what practicum experiences or placements would you recommend for school psychologists, graduate students who want to work with preschoolers? Um, <laughs> Good, Amy. no one speaks, um, we all speak together. <laughs> I think Sarah and I are both unmuting ourselves. Um, you know, I can tell you that um, when you're looking at practicum or any kind of experience, you want to be around those preschool classrooms. So opportunities to um, supervise support mm -hmm. if um, a preschool setting will allow you to come in and do any kind of interventions or, or supports for students, that's always good. Once you're looking at practicum or internship, definitely reaching out to districts and talking to them about pairing you with supervisors that have that opportunity so that you can be um, able to do those opportunities. So like in our district, um, every intern practicum student is required to come in and observe uh, a preschool observation or preschool evaluation in clinic, which we do open clinic um, on Tuesdays and Wednesdays in the arena style setting. So they come in and have to observe and watch and, and watch how we complete these evaluations. And then they're also required to, um, to complete some evaluations like that. So just when you're looking at those opportunities, going out and, and really searching for supervisors that can provide that. Yep, I would say the same thing. Yeah, so same as Amy was saying, you know, that when you're having conversations, practicum is, you know, still in those early, you know, kind of that early year is just, you know, really kind of seeking out those opportunities. In terms of internship, I know when you're going and doing those interviews, asking about what opportunities there are for psychologists. I know in Guilford, and um, Laura's nodding her head, so I think, you know, it's we do have interns and practicum students who do have a specific interest in preschool. And so then they are always given the opportunity to shadow us. We may not provide their only supervision um, because they're, you know, everybody's looking for a well-rounded internship and practicum experience. Um, but we do have some that take a higher interest in preschool and take on quite a few more cases. Um, but I, you know, I think what Amy said also another, when you're learning about this population, especially um, the more you spend time in the actual classrooms, the more you get to see what what does early development and learning look like in a preschool classroom? It's not just do I know my letters, my numbers, my colors and sounds. It's you know can I problem solve? Can I regulate my emotions? Um, and, you know those are it's a it's a kind of a different beast than what we spend a lot of times in our training programs looking at. For sure, and I and I think that those experiences can start in practicum. They can start a little bit sooner than that even. I remember, I think I was in my first semester of grad school at Appalachian and had an opportunity to spend some time in the Child Development Center on campus. And wow, I mean, it, it was just, it was such a pivotal experience for me. Um, and really where I first started thinking, I wanna be a school psychologist for preschoolers, this is what I wanna do. And then had an opportunity to take a class in preschool assessment while I was at, at Appalachian, and then looked for practicum experiences that would allow me to, to spend some time in a preschool, and definitely in my internship, I, I did the same thing. So look for little ways that you can kind of insert yourself into the life of a, a preschool program and see if that's what you wanna do. Okay, um, and don't forget, enter your questions here. Um, here's a question, uh, and Amy, it might be something you're comfortable answering, but they were very interested in this community-based school wraparound special program, and you were saying there are not many of those, and so kind of the question is, why aren't there more of those, and um, why are they uh, uh, losing ground as a, a model? So um, if you know much about exceptional children's services, um, the idea is to always place a student in the least restrictive environment. So you want them to spend the most time with their non-disabled peers as possible. Um, when you're looking at a community developmental school, you're looking at the students all being identified with some form of disability. And so you're looking at the most restrictive environment. And so the idea is that they don't see as many typically developing peers or neurotypical peers 
to um, have that growth and comparison to. Now, for some of our students, um, obviously they need those, but for some of our students that are higher need students, we're more interested in seeing what growth they, they can make as com rather than comparing them to typically developing peers on a regular basis. So, you know, if you have students that have a huge number of needs and a lot of support that's needed, they really need that support more necessarily than they do need to be compared to typically developing peers. So in our case, um, the, the school is the community developmental school program and it has been moved it was previously in its own school location um, which was called Edgewood um, they have since split off the K through five students and we just had a new school building built um, right next to the Air Force Base and so they combined the K5 of our, our preschool five of our developmental school into the um, elementary school there and so they have their own wing but they are able to walk down the halls with typically developing peers have um, time in the cafeteria with them and that kind of thing it still provides a very small classroom setting they're still around disabled peers um, but they do have some exposure and that's been a really great program and our 6 through 12 will be changing locations eventually also um, so with that it's it's a fantastic program for our highest need students. I mean, the the school the, the the CDSP is is such a supportive place, and it's so supportive for our kids and the families love it. And um, you know, it's it's a wonderful thing. And I think there are there's either three or five still left in the entire state, counting us. So it really is a, a model that's that's dying out, unfortunately. But I, I just I feel like it's a fantastic thing, and I'm so glad we have it. And it's just such an, a wonderful opportunity for our kids and for the families because it really is like a family environment. So, so the alternate the alternate side of that, folks are saying, where do kids across the state who are in this severe category? So where are they at? Do they go to a regular school setting in a self-contained class or are they at home? Uh, so it depends. Um, and, and Sarah, you may want to talk about this. Um, um, the, so for us, if they are not um, eligible for CDSP, but also your high school students would be in a, typical, in, a, in a separate classroom in, your, in their home elementary school. So those would be your highest need students. Um, some of them might be homebound depending on the need. Um, like I said, Edgewood, or sorry, CDSP has uh, nursing staff and has, um, like I said, all therapies right there. So it does allow for supporting more high need students than might be able to be supported necessarily in a classroom. But um, again, that varies from district to district. Sarah, what, did, what does Guilford have? So Guilford has two program, two schools that are, well, we have four what are considered public separate schools where everybody in that school has an IEP in our, of our most intense needs. Two of those four are are described exactly how Amy is. Our most medically intense need the full continuum of services. Almost all of them require um, speech, OT, PT, nursing to some capacity. A lot of them require nursing, which is why they're in that public separate. Um, so that those programs are still there. Um, a lot across the state, there are you know in a lot of districts there are still at least not a lot of districts, but there's still some of those public separate schools that may not have quite the you know quite that level of um, intensity but similar our um most of our children who are still considered adapted curriculum or separate level are um you know they attend one of our public schools within that school building so they are able to be in a more least restrictive environment so they have opportunity to still be around quote unquote typically or neurotypically developing peers um in some capacity so it, but you know again you know, just like what we've talked about with preschool services, the service delivery varies greatly from county to county in what, um, you know, what has to be served and how we provide services is, you know, federally and state mandated. What it looks like varies, but there is, you know, is and should still be a continuum of services based on that child's developmental need. Um, that's the right answer. You know, I'm sure, you know, people have varying experiences and frustrations across mm -hmm. all of that. So, you know, uh, the, uh, oh, uh, okay. I was talking to my director today that um, 
you know, your I, the, the, the student's need drives the individualized education plan and the individualized education plan drives the service provision. So, you know, it should be what the student needs or what the child needs, not what the county can afford. And that's what federal and state mandates say is that we do need to provide what the student needs. And unfortunately, I think one of the, this is relates to one of the questions, the, when you say that, it really highlights the thought that this question brings forth, which is, you know, isn't it against the law to have such inequities across the state? So I don't know if you want to answer that question, but basically bringing up, you know, all these inequities in the um, uh, services that you can provide, Amy, like you just said, you're, this is what the IEP says, this is the services you deserve, but we're hearing you say, um, and we've heard the same thing on our other two webinars, the services uh, provided or even possible are very different in every school district. So they're saying, isn't that against the law? Um, well, <laughs> thinking, <laughs> Everybody's like, how do we put this? Um, you know, it, inequity is unfortunate and inequity is, it should be illegal. Unfortunately, um, because determinations of funding are made by people that are not in the school system every day, we do see inequities. Um, there is a certain level of service provision that does have to be met. How it is met, and to what degree it is met is not mandated, but there is a certain level of minimum. And that's very carefully said so that <laughs> nobody fires me. <laughs> but really it, it is, you know, we would like to see every school, we would like to see um, on another slide, you're gonna see in a minute what the proposed number of school psychologists to student ratio would be. We would like to see that across the country. We would like to see every student get exactly what they need um, to the highest level. And you can see in that slide, um, our, the National Association of School Psychologists recommends one school, school psychologist to 500 students. North Carolina is not even remotely close to that. We are currently at one to almost 2,500 students. So you can see that no, we don't, we don't have what we need. And we would like to see us have what we need and for all students. Like I said, we got into this field for the benefit of students, not for the money. So um, we do have a better ratio with some local funding, which is one to 2000, but it's still, um, we need two at least psychologists for every one we have. And like I said, there are 12 school districts that have absolutely no school psychologists in them. And that is, that is heartbreaking and terrifying to me because we know those students need those supports and they're not getting them on a consistent basis from their school psychologist. Because, so it, should it be illegal? Yes. Is it? Uh, I'm not an education lawyer. I should have gone to school for that. So. <laughs> Well, well, and also when, we, when we're talking a little bit about inequity, especially at least in tonight, in the scope of what we're talking about tonight, um, you know, thinking about inequities in terms of, you know, looking at even the three different stories that we tell, we all have do similar things, but because of, you know, like Amy is one, the only person who provides preschool psychological services in addition to her other roles, so that limits her ability to do kind of the bigger scope of practice that she is more than capable and trained to do. She fits it in, but you know, there's only so many hours in a day, right? We have, you know, we have counties that have no school psychologists, period. And then we have counties that have people who are doing, serving K-12 schools as well as doing preschool evaluations. So, you know, their capability to be able to go in and spend time doing teacher training, parent training, um, more support is it's just not a possibility because of you know thresholds on time. Um, so you know so that's kind of a little bit what we're talking about. It's not necessarily just you know service delivery inequities, which we know are out there. That let's be honest that you know we are you know every district is I do believe is doing the best that they can with the resources that we have. But you know there are limitations to our resources specifically in North Carolina. Um, that you know, we just have to look at you know how do we you know how do we address these gaps um, to try to make sure that everybody's getting what they need, and you know, knowing that that's a very subjective opinion as well. Um, so 
the objective is, you know, the objective data is what's on the IEP and what does that student, the team decide that that student needs. The subjectivity is what does that look like and how can we make that happen? And, and also, you know, one thing, go ahead, okay. Laura, Amy. Okay, go ahead, Laura. Oh, <laughs> so I, you know, I keep on hearing the same sentence in my head. This is why it's so important to talk to legislators. This is why it's so important to advocate for, for this profession and really for the young children in our state. It's because, you know, everything, we, we say we don't want to become political, but but every decision that's made has something to do with politics. And, and these decisions are made at a state level and then at a local level. And they really do affect real kids and real families. And so one of the best ways that, um, one of the best methods that we have for change is uh, people across the state talking to local and state representatives and um, voting for people who will support education and who will support um, the, the, the funding that we need um, because it really does make a difference. So, so there's Amy, a little <laughs> You wanted to add something, Amy. Yeah, I was going to say, I just got a message from um, one of our, another psychologist that let me know the latest data says there's actually 25 districts with no school psychologist. So we've gone from 12 to 25. And, you know, I think what also needs to be noted is that we need to be thinking outside the box for um, getting people to come to these districts where there are no school psychologists. So a lot of these are smaller districts that are in our outer edges of our state. So your small coastal region, your northern part, of the, your, your outer edges of the state is where we see a lot of um, lack of school psychologists and therefore not equity and provision. And so what we've talked about, um, and it's an idea that you can start with, is try growing your own school psychologist. So in our own district, we are actually recruited some teachers who are going back and getting their school psychology degree to, to become school psychologists. And that's a very natural progression from getting an undergrad in teaching and moving into your, your graduate degree in school psychology and then coming back as a school psychologist. So thinking about growing your own in some of those districts and, and encouraging, you know, high school students and um, undergrads in college to look at the field because we need some name recognition. We need people to, to know what we are and talk about us and talk about what a great job it is. And, and, we, and I do love my job. And I think both of these ladies would agree with me that, you know, we're still in this job because we love it and we love the kids. So, you know, having that opportunity to do this is a, is a great thing. You know, one thing I wanted to add here that um, has come up in our other webinars, and I want, in case we have different people attending or listening to this in the future, um, I want to say that one of the things that the North Carolina uh, Association, your professional association of school psychologists, has done a remarkable job in is, is in this advocacy work. And one of the biggest ways of the advocacy, people always think of advocacy is calling and saying, I want this, I want that, vote for this, uh, pledge this. But we all have here together and on my other webinars talked about, no, the first step we often need to do is to educate people. That most folks have no clue. Um, I'm pretty immersed in the public education sector. I've learned a tremendous amount of information from these women and from the women who joined me in the other two webinars about the, the school psychologist's role and the lack of, of, of the pipeline and the lack of funding, but I had no clue about the necessity and the requirements and the beauty and the need for preschool services. And I encourage everyone to educate yourself. And one of the best ways, as Sarah said earlier, is get involved by following some of these organizations and getting information. Because this is not, um, you know, a lot of people get interested in things because it's about their kid. Um, I'm interested, and I think you women are, and that's why you went into your profession. We're in it because we're interested in all our children. And so even if you don't have a child, or if your children have aged out, you can be very interested and involved in this. We all have learned how important it is and what a difference it makes when kids come to school kindergarten ready. So you can imagine um, for a child who's not facing any, any um, special barriers or any IEP issues, 
uh, coming to school in kindergarten ready um, is probably going to be fairly easy. But when you have on top of, of your age and inexperience in a social setting, severe uh, mental or social uh, limitations, um, we're really talking about a double whammy. So uh, as, a, as so every parent can identify, you want your kid to go to kindergarten, you want them to know how to do these things, count this, this many numbers, know these colors. Um, so one of the things that I really believe strongly in is universal pre-K. I believe that every child deserves pre-K, that the public school setting is the best place for pre-K to happen. Um, and, I, and I do believe that um, it's, it's a shame that you spend all your time doing assessments. Um, that was a common theme that you <laughs> all do a lot of. Everybody is doing 70% or more of their time in assessments. It's the same thing for K through 12, for those who are interested. Um, this problem uh, gets worse uh, at, at you know, both ends when I have my view. I see some really serious needs here at pre-K and I see some really serious needs with our high school students right now. Um, when we have the, one of the highest suicide r rates in the, in the country, when suicide is the second leading cause of kids in 14, from 10 to 14, um, we know that we need these kind of services in our communities and in our schools where kids spend, as Amy said earlier, most of their time. So one last thing I want to bring up is that um, uh, we have a new school superintendent for the State Department of Public Instruction, um, Dr. Truitt, I do know that she has some interest or she has talked with several folks in the, in the professional organization for uh, the North Carolina Association of School Psychologists. Uh, she seems to be very interested in uh, this, this issue. Um, I, so I'm encouraging people to lobby your state board of education, not just your local because what we would really like to see is a staff position at the North Carolina Department of Public Construction to work specifically on developing a um, internship program across the state of North Carolina that's more robust and equitable and to really um, work on trying to build the pipeline of future school psychologists. While it's great for local school districts here or there, like Amy was saying, they're going to try to grow your own. And when I've been to other places where some school psychologists have taken it into their own hands, they've been calling local schools of education saying, give me an intern. Uh, they can live in my, my attic. I mean, they, they've offered crazy things because they're trying to get someone to come to their county to, to be an intern. So that's great. And I am appreciative of people like you um, and others who have joined us in these webinars and for the association. However, I challenge all of our listeners um, to write your State Board of Education, indicate that you're aware of this need and advocate for a position, a full-time position. These women do this extra advocacy work and education work outside of their jobs. Tonight, many of them have had long, hard days. Um, many of them have obligations at home. And here we are taking another hour and a half of their time. So we really appreciate it. So um, I think the uh, last thing that um, I would say in closing is please get yourself um, involved in how we can make um, our society, our world, our community, our schools, uh, our neighborhoods um, stronger. And that's by making sure that all our children have an access to a fair, high quality public education. And that should start uh, in preschool, in my view, because I think every child deserves an opportunity to come to school kindergarten ready. The sooner we address some of these special needs that some children have, the sooner they can get on the path um, to success academically and socially. Um, and I think we started this program off tonight by Laura saying <coughs> the economic and social benefits of caring about these young children and getting them assessed and diagnostically um, identified and into a path. How, how it's not just the right thing to do, but it benefits our society in terms of um, uh, its economic impact. It's money well spent. The sooner we have children 
um, be able to deal with the barriers in their life to learning um, the, the sooner. So please, um, so I, I'm going to stop here and say that uh, a last thing I'll say is, please, any of you listening, if you have a personal story as a teacher, as a parent, as a community member, um, write it. We will publish it. We send out our newsletter once a week uh, to about 100,000 people. Uh, we have about 30,000 people that follow us on Facebook. We'll publish it there. Um, we want very much to share your view. We ask people to kind of keep it to, you know, 750 to 1,000 words. Um, but if you have uh, something you'd like to share, a story, recommendations, a view, send it to us. We like to publish things from teachers, educators. We like to publish things from parents. Uh, because I think that, um, I think it was Sarah earlier that said, and, and Amy, that a personal story sometime can really sell. When I've listened to these women and earlier uh, several other women and these presentations of webinars, when they talk about their just their daily lives, their work schedule, um, when they talk about some of the special needs their children have that they're not able to meet. When I talked to a, a school psychologist who quit for two years, she was the only school psychologist in the county. Um, the county, you know, uh, the county where there was 80,000 uh, kids. Um, so I'm, I'm just saying that we realize that those stories, I think, resonate when people are trying to understand the impact of this. So in our last slide of the night, I'm giving you, um, uh, wait a minute, I think, uh, yeah, here I am. I, I went forward and backwards, I apologize. Here are the um, emails for our panelists tonight. Melissa's listed down there, and Melissa wasn't able to join us tonight because she was she was not feeling too well. But she is also willing to uh, is a school psychologist, very knowledgeable, um, very active in in this issue. And any of these names, I'm going to leave this up here for just a second. And as we close, Sarah, Laura, uh, Amy, if there's any closing remarks you'd like to make, I'll let you do that as people are writing down your addresses. I think I just want to you know, say thank you, Yvonne, and to um, Public Schools First for giving us this opportunity and kind of taking on um, helping school psychologists kind of get out there and express what we do. Um, you know, I probably speak for everybody else too, but, um, you know, preschool, this age group is my passion. This is, you know, something that I feel very strongly about. Um, and I think, you know, given that opportunity to express and share what it is that we do and the importance and the value of it has just been, you know, I really appreciate this opportunity and I appreciate those who have been on the call listening and I hope you were able to get some good information and insight tonight um, about kind of the importance of this um, and our, you know, the importance of all of our children um, right now and, you know, for our long-term children in the future, how we can support them. And it starts, at, you know, it doesn't start in public schools at five when they step into a kindergarten classroom. It starts well before then. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Very welcome. Yep. And I would just say, um, you know, keep building those partnerships and don't be afraid to ask for what you think is best for kids. We need all of you, every one of you on this call, every friend and family member you've got. That's how change is made. That's how things happen at the state and local level even is going to these meetings, showing up and bringing up these topics and having your data. And if any, you need any help, any data, reach out to us. We're happy to help and support. Just reach out to us. Very good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's why that's why we included our email addresses on the previous slide because and we mean it. You know, if you if you have questions or if you have um, you know some some uh, something that you think about after the presentation is done that you think, oh my gosh, I wish I had asked this question or I wish I had mentioned this. That's why our contact information is here. Please use it if you would like. Thank you all all so much. It's been a great evening. I've learned a lot again every time I talk to you. Uh, this will be up again to remind everybody on YouTube. Please go and get this, uh, this link to our YouTube channel and share it around. And while you're there, look for the other two uh, webinars we have uh, from other school psychologists. And uh, we are on your team. Uh, in closing, do, does your association have memberships that are open to the public. I'm just, that you do? Okay. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that real fast. I mean, is it just go to your website? 
Yeah, okay. if you if you go to the North Carolina School of Psychology website, um, there are affiliate memberships and there are other memberships that are available and we would love to have you be a part of our association and we would love to share information with you. And like I said, building those partnerships is key and getting that information out, that's, that's the key to all of this. All right, well, thank you very much and good night. And thank you so much for sharing your time and your knowledge with not only me and the community, but thank you for all you do in your personal um, and your professional lives every day to improve um, the quality of life for all of our children. It is deeply appreciated. Good night. Night. Yeah, bye. -bye. bye.